now? Oh, okay. Um, all right, well, you can um, see the, the, the title there, and I will start by asking, do you know who Crocker Johnson is? And basically, well, first of all, can you hear me? Okay. What? Not how do, how, do, how, do I, how do I become louder? The mic is... How's that? Better? Okay. Um, basically, if you uh, recognize any of the names Barnaby, Mr. O'Malley, or Harold, you probably would have read or had read to you the 1940s comic strip Barnaby or the children's book Harold and the Purple Crayon. Uh, <laughs> okay? Hence the first part of the subtitle, From Cartoons in Black and White. Okay, now unless you've read the abstract to this talk, you probably have no idea what theorems in color refer to, and that refers to the title of a 1980 exhibition at the National Museum of History and Technology, um, which showed paintings by Crockett Johnson, all of which were based on mathematical diagrams and constructions. And now I have to remember how to use this. No? There we go. OK. <laughs> I, first, let me apologize for reading. I, I'm not you, when I give talks that aren't mathematical talks, I find I do better reading because I forget otherwise what I'm going to say. <laughs> so I'm reading this now. Who am I? I'm an historian of mathematics who read Barnaby as a child, and I will never forget him. My introduction to Crockett Johnson's mathematical paintings came during the summer of 1979 when I was beginning a transition from mathematical logician to historian of mathematics. And that was under the directorship of Uta Merzbach, who was curator of the mathematics at the Museum of History and Technology. And if you don't know what that is, it's what's now the, Cur the National Museum of American History. So they got rid of the technology <laughs> part, and, but mathematics is still there. Although my intention was to study the American women in mathematics, during the summer that I was, was at the museum, the, um, the museum acquired many of the mathematical paintings done by Crockett Johnson. And I spent my sabbatical, which was the next spring, at the museum. And one of the things I did was help prepare the exhibit Theorems in Color. Okay. Now, there are 70, I'm sorry, there are 80 paintings, mathematical paintings by Crockett Johnson in the museum collection. What you see on the top are the, is the, uh, website of all where you can find photographs and descriptions of all of them, all of those 80. And I was able to use that source plus some other stuff um, at the museum for much of what I am showing you today. Only there, there you see three of Crockett Johnson's painting. Only five of them are currently in the museum building, and all of those. Are on, including those three, are on display outside the museum director's conference room. And that's not accessible without a prior appointment. So nobody gets to see Harold, um, Crockett Johnson's paintings unless they go online, basically, unless you work hard. Um, and one thing is that over the years, I have stopped calling him Crockett Johnson and call him CJ. So that's what I'm going to do for the rest of this talk. And so uh, you, you'll hear it occasionally, but mostly it's CJ. I am now retired and I serve as a behind the scenes volunteer at the museum. Mostly what I do is write, write web descriptions like the ones that are on there, I, although I didn't write those. Uh, the person who spoke, gave this talk last year, Peggy Kidwell, wrote all of those. She's now the curator. Um, now, I have been able to go to the, even with the government shutdown, I was able to go to the museum a few times this year. And there, 
in the collections, in addition to the paintings which aren't in the building, in the building there are um, various things, including diagrams and letters about the paintings that, that CJ had. And, but the main source for what I know about the biography of CJ was a biography that was written by him, by, sorry, not by him, about him and his wife, Ruth Krauss, who was also a well-known author of uh, children's books. The biography was written, as you can see, by Philip Nell, who was a CJ fan before he wrote the book. And he teaches English at Kansas State. And uh, remember that when you, I mentioned what something he said. Another source of my information was a website that uh, that Phil Nell maintains, and he created it and, and maintains. So you can find a lot of information there. But he doesn't have, I have links to all, the, all the, uh, the paintings the way the other one does. Now, what I will be doing today is explaining how someone with no mathematical training at all in mathematics spent the last 10 years of his life producing mathematical paintings some of which are based on his own original constructions. Okay. Crockett Johnson was born David Johnson Lisk in 1906 and grew up in Queens, New York. According to Phil Nell, and I quote this, to distinguish himself from other boys named David in the neighborhood, he borrowed a name from a comic strip about frontiersman Davy Crockett. Also, when he was in the late 20s, CJ dropped his last name because it was spelled L-E-I-S-K and was often mispronounced as Lysk, and he got tired of hearing that. Now, he used the name Crockett Johnson uh, professionally, but he was always called Dave by his friends. While he was in high school, Dave was an artist for his school's ma magazine, and he contributed some cartoons to that, magazine, to that magazine. After he graduated from high school, CJ had a scholarship to Cooper Union and studied art there for a year. His father died the spring of that year, so being as he, the family had no support, CJ was forced to leave school in order to earn a living. He eventually became the art editor of a weekly magazine and studied art at NYU. But then the stock market crashed, and things did not go very well, and he became interested in left-wing politics. He then published his first political ca cartoon in 1934 in the communist magazine New Masses. In 1936, he joined the staff of that magazine as an art editor. Now, during the, the 1930s, 30s, CJ was just one of a large number of people, including mathematicians, who thought of themselves as communists, even if they weren't members of the Communist Party. They formed an elitist movement whose goals were economic and social justice. In particular, communists were in the forefront of the civil rights movements during the, the decade of the 30s. Although CJ contributed many cartoons to new masses, he didn't become known as a cartoon until he started a cartoonist, until he started publishing cartoons in Collier's, which was a national magazine with a large re readership. His word list, and always word list, not just here, um, uh, strip, Little Man with the Eyes, appeared in Collier's from March 1940 until January 1943. C.J. met his future wife, Ruth Krauss, in 1939, and in 1941, they left New York and moved to Darien, Connecticut. That is where C.J. developed the comic strip Barnaby that would debut in the popular front newspaper, PM, and that happened in April 1942. Now, the two main characters in the comic strip were the names I mentioned before, Barnaby, and his, but this I didn't mention, his fairy godfather, Mr. O'Malley. Mr. O'Malley was introduced in the second strip. While all of the children in the strip could see Mr. O'Malley, none of the adults ever did. 
both Barnaby and his fa fairy godfather are seen here, more quick, more obviously, uh, on the first of a projected series of Barnaby newspaper strips, of all the Barnaby news strips. If Barnaby is new to you but looks familiar, it may be because he looks a bit like Harold. <laughs> Except, of course, for the clothes. Just over a year after starting the Barnaby strip, CJ introduced Atlas, Mr. O'Malley's friend, whom he, whom he refers to as a mental giant. While Atlas was named for the mythical Atlas who carried the world on his shoulder, CJ's Atlas only see whoops, went the wrong way. Yo, no, I went the right way. See, CJ's Atlas only had to carry a uh, slide rule, which is the stick that is next to him that's almost as tall as he is. Big, very large slide rule. Okay. Here we see that Atlas does not remember Mr. O'Malley's name. As Mr. O'Malley explains, Atlas does not burden his mind with a lot of easily obtainable data. Instead, he uses a slide rule to reconstruct information. Atlas is apparently able to use his slide rule to interpret the, the, the symbols appearing in the last frame of the first strip and the third frame of the second strip. And he gets the answers, O'Malley and no. However, the symbols Atlas considers are strung together with no mathematical meaning at all. Furthermore, a slide rule is used for calculations relating to numbers, not symbols. So Atlas could not have interpreted the system using a slide rule, even if the systems had made sense, even if the symbols had made sense. Okay. Now we go ahead to January 27th of the following year. Atlas once again used his slide rule to evaluate strings of symbols, but this time the symbols form three mathematical expressions that Atlas correctly evaluates to get the answer O plus MA plus LLEY. And then he greets Mr. O'Malley by name. <laughs> OK. Now, CJ did not explain his newfound language of mathematics to his readers. So only those who themselves knew some mathematics could tell the difference from the original. They, and they also could evaluate the expressions along with Atlas. Well, we do not know who helped CJ introduce these expressions. Phil Nell hypothesizes that it may have been a friend who was a chemical engineer, who certainly should have been able to do that. Since Atlas's slide rule computations reappear at least through September 1947, it is clear that mathematics was somehow calling CJ well before he produced any mathematical paintings. While CJ was drawing and writing Barnaby, he also was very busy working on other projects involving Barnaby, something I learned this time, including a Broadway play. Therefore, he decided to turn over the entire production of the strip to others starting in 1946. However, in September 47, he resumed the writing, although not the drawing of the strip. And that arrangement in con continued until the final strip on February 2nd, 1952. The same year that Barnaby ended, CJ's first children's book, Who's Upside Down? And as you can see, you can see the, what that was. What, that was when it was published. His next public book that was published was in 1955. And that was the one that is most well known, Harold and the Purple Crayon. And some of you read that yourselves, and some of that had read it to your children, and some of it was read to you. <laughs> His last book, children's book, was published in 1965, at which point he was almost 60 years old. Now, in February 1966, C.J. wrote a friend about what he called his three-month career. And he was a painter of a, serious, a series of romantic tributes to the great geometric mathematicians from Pythagoras on up. He also noticed 
that he had done his early painting in an economical two or three foot size. In fact, of the seven paintings in the Smithsonian collections that are dated from 1965, only two are larger than the economical size. In that same letter, CJ wrote, so far I have enlarged only one. Euclid's famous proof of a Pythagorean right triangle. He enlarged it to four feet by four feet. And he goes on to say, and it is a kind of a most imposing thing, like God or your fifth grade teacher confronting you. It is very pretty, too. That painting was based on a diagram of Euclid's windmill proof of the theorem that appears in Newman's The World of Mathematics. In fact, all of the museum's seven, seven paintings dated 1960 were either inspired by or directly based on diagrams found in that publication, which, if you don't know, takes up four books. Another source of diagrams for CJ's early paintings was a book written in 1964 that he acquired in November 1966. It was written by his friend named Red Valens, who had sent him the, the copy. That book, The Number of Things, Pythagoras, Geometry, and Humming Strings, is described online as an introduction to terms and history of numbers and math theories related to the Pythagorean theorem. And it is listed as a ju for a juvenile audience. Okay. Among the diagrams from Valen's book that CJ used as a basis for painting is the one which the poster for this, this Smithsonian e exhibition was based on. Okay. Now, in 1972, CJ published a description of how he looked at his early work in Leonardo, whose subtitle was The Inter International Journal of the Contemporary Artist. In that article, CJ implied that he had started painting even earlier than 65, because in 71 he wrote, a decade er ago, upon belatedly discovering aesthetic values in the Pythagorean right triangle and Euclidean geometry, I began a series of geometric paintings deriving from famous mathematical theorems, both ancient and modern. By the end of 1966, CJ had produced at least 40 paintings. And on April 5th, 1967, the first exhi exhibition of his mathematical paintings opened under the title, and it's a long one, Abstractions of Abstractions. Schematic paintings deriving from axioms and theorems of geometry, from Pythagoras to Apollonius of Perga, and from Desargues and the Kepler to the 20th century. The paintings represented in the subtitle span not only time, but also subject material. And of the 30 paintings that were exhibited, only 21 are in the Smithsonian collections. Now, I will be able to show you some of the ones that are not in the col museum collection because I have scans of photographs of many of CJ's paintings, although I do not remember their origin. I had hoped to use CJ's title as a guide to choosing which paintings to, from, from the Glazer Gallery exhibition I would show you, but it turns out that at least the first one that refers to Pythagoras is not in the collections and I don't have a scan of it, so you can't see that one. However, I will show you the others. Okay. Starting with Apollonius and his conic curve. The diagram represents what Apollonius re referred to as the locus with respect to three and four lines, and he did this in his multi-volume book called Conics. It, appear the, it appears in the mathematics it appears in the world of mathematics in a discussion how the 17th century Descartes simplified the problem by looking at it in terms of two variables, much easier than what Apollonius was doing. Next, CJ chose to include two paintings in the exhibition that relate to Desargues' theorem, which is a theorem that's fundamental to the field of projective geometry. 
The first painting is directly based on a diagram that illustrates the theorem and highlights the two triangles that are crucial to its hypothesis. The theorem says that, that if the top black triangle projects to the bottom one, the sides of the triangles that correspond meet on a line, in this case, the right edge of the painting. The second, oops, went too far. The second painting of Desargues corresponds to another diagram in the world of mathematics. However, because the painting isn't in the museum's collection and there was nothing obvious that allowed me to identify his source, at first I wasn't able to determine even what diagram it was based on. Eventually I thought of rotating a diagram and adding, um, adding the, the labels to the, to the vertices. And then I found something that matched it. Now, that painting is a clear example of CJ choosing to stress the aesthetic value of the, of the diagram rather than the, rather than the mathematics in it. So he did both. All right. Now, then we have, um, oops, then we have that CJ exhibited two paintings representing the first two of Kepler's laws of planetary motion. The first painting represents the proof of the first law that all planets move in elliptic orbits with the sun at one of the ellipses foci. The painting is based on, but, not, is, but is not just a copy of, a diagram that actually goes back to Kepler. And it shows how he convinced himself of the validity of the first law. The, this, the World of Mathematics article just says the following, the, well, describes it as follows. follows. If you look at that small drawing up there in the corner, that was a tracing of a triumphant figure that Kepler placed by the diagram to celebrate what he called his victory in having proved that an elliptical orbit is consistent with the observation of something he called the law of equable dis description of area, which we now call the Kepler's second law. Okay. Then we have one that clearly does show the diagram, and this is the modern statement of the second law is that a line connecting the sun and any planet sweeps out equal area in equal time. The painting illustrates that law with three, the white, the white areas being shown in white, and those are the ones that are equal. A consequence of the law is that the planet is moving faster when it's closest to the sun and slowest when it's furthest from the sun, and the, and the diagram and painting show just that. He made three paintings that look exactly the same over a three-year period, and they're the same, but they all have different sizes. Why? I don't know. Okay. Now we come to the 20th century. He didn't put a name to that, but the only one in his paintings that would have made sense well, he, he, he didn't put a name to the, he did put the name Einstein, but um, in, the, in, the, in the subtitle, he hadn't put a name next to it. And in the, the so this is the only painting that, that I know of that uh, CJ ever did that relates to anything of, in the 20th century. And it, it, the painting is not in the museum collection, so I can only speculate that I've picked the right diagram to, from which it, he, he painted it. And that came from George Gamow's 1, 2, 3, Infinity. And we don't even know if he owned that book. That diagram looks like a conventional, looks at a conventional way in Einstein's way of representing what Gamow referred to as a space-time axis cross, something I'd never heard of before. And in order to explain Einstein's version of turning the axis cross, Gamow used an example involving a bank robbery, a plane crash, and traveling on a double-decker bus in New York City. And it took several pages. <laughs> OK, now, as Phil Nell put in his biography of CJ, after the Glazer Gallery exhibit, 
Johnson was no longer content to paint the theorems of others. Right. At that point, CJ, like many amateur mathematicians, started to think about finding a way to do what Euclid and his successors couldn't. You the mathematicians here probably can guess what that is. And that is use only an unmarked ruler and compass to square a circle, trisect an arbitrary angle, and duplicate a cube. It appears that in preparation for attempting to square the circle, CJ looked at a related but solvable problem, which is called the squaring of a loom. The area bounded by the arcs of two circles, and they're called loons because that is the shape of a crescent moon. Now, the problem of squaring a loon was discussed in the chapter from squares to crescents in Red Valen's book. But in that painting, we see that the loon has, and in, that, in this painting, we see the loon has the same area as the white triangle, which is a direct consequence of what was in Valen's book as A plus B equals T. Now, because uh, CJ called it loons and Valens called it crescents, it is exceedingly likely that CJ also read about them in the world of mathematics where they are called loons. And here we see some more. The, one, the painting on the left is dated 1968 and directly corresponds to the diagram in, in the uh, world of mathematics that CJ must have looked at but didn't annotate. However, on the page preceding that diagram, the narrator refers to it have, as having, and this is a quote, three semicircles described on the respective sides of the triangle. Now, that does, is what is, you see in the one on the left. Two of the semicircles um, are with diameter, the sides of the uh, isosceles right triangle give you uh, white loons, and they come from a triangle, a semicircle that, has, that is part of the formation of that. And then the other one is from a semicircle that overlays the black triangle, right. which is a little hard to think of as, as it's, it's, it's harder to think of as a third um, semicircle. So therefore, CJ makes up his own picture and puts it on the bottom. So you can see what they were actually saying there. There's one on each side. Now, now we come to some other stuff. In 1968, he also finished a painting he called Squared Circle, Artist's Construction. Now, we know we, we can't square a circle, but the diagram on the right and the painting clearly represent the same thing. Um, and just as, and you can see what's, well, on the back of the painting is, he knew it wasn't a, a exactly the, the square root, it, it wasn't exactly the square root of pi. But the interesting thing about the paint, the, the um, thing on the right hand, on the right hand side is that where that appeared was in a literary magazine. <laughs> and it was, it was published. Now, this, the, what he wrote on the back clearly shows that it, it was a good it was a good approximation, but he, and he was a clear of that, but because he didn't keep, keep put that in the title, he somehow didn't think that was relevant. In other words, he didn't understand that an approximation wasn't constructing it. Right? And that's something that lots of people didn't understand. Right? And mathematicians have their own way of thinking and don't always project it well enough to the rest of the world. <laughs> OK, now, he wrote a lot of people. He wanted to tell a lot of people that he had done this. Because look, he had squared the circle. So one of the people he wrote was Martin Gardner, who was then writing the mathematical games column to the Scientific American. And he suggested that CJ read various books and articles and submit an explanation to the British Journal of the Mathematical Gazette. Of course, he also told them that it wasn't 
really a squaring, but that's irrelevant. Now, CJ wrote the explanation and submitted it not just to, to, that, to the, um, the, the British uh, Mathematical Gazette, but also to the MAA's American Mathematical Monthly. And the monthly editor, Harley Flanders, who was a Barnaby fan, wrote him, this is the second letter he, at least the second letter he, um, he wrote him. And as, because you can see, I have a file of all your letters. This one was done in, was, was in August 1969 uh, response. And he said, I hope you will understand that it is absolutely impossible for me to publish anything in the monthly on squaring the circle other than a possible new very short proof of its impossibility. You have no idea how much mail I received from would-be circle squares, angle trisectors, etc. of an article in this direction always unleashes a real flood of new contributions. What is more, mathematicians simply are not interested in these problems anymore. <laughs> okay. Now, now, about a year earlier, uh, in May 1968. The Mathematical Gazette's editor had already written CJ telling him his method of approximation was one of the best I have seen. It is delightfully simple, and I think we can spare a little space for it. <laughs> OK, so he wrote a page and a half article. That got published. And in it, he presented a remarkably economic, this is my language, a actually, I think it's my husband's language. A remarkable economic straight edge and compass construction that culminates in a line segment whose length is within uh, one one hundred thousandth of the square root of pi. Now, one one hundred thousandth is uh, 10 to the minus fifth. OK, now, that actually was less accurate than the one that he, uh, that he had done in the painting. Now, what he didn't do in this article was to explain his thought process that caused him to have his first line of the proof, a line segment of length, the square root of two. Okay. I mean, it just comes out of nowhere. Yeah. OK. Because he wasn't a mathematician. He wouldn't know that people would care about that, something like that. In nice, this is a painting from 1972, and this is based on a di diagram. It's even simpler than the diagram that appears in the Mathematical Gazette article. But it has the same accuracy and, as described in that publication. The other diagram on the page shows his original method using square root of 2 to produce a good approximation of the square root of pi. Now, the reason I... I enlarge those numbers at the bottom was so that you could see why he chose to start with the square root of 2. Now, I didn't notice that, but he did, and it is that the relationship, that the decimal part of pi, which starts 1.159, is approximately one-tenth of the square root of 2. <laughs> and that meant he could. That meant he could use things that were related to the square root of two over and over again, and get something that was close to the square root of pi. All right. Now, this next painting is much more complicated, and is based on a diagram in something that he wrote but dis dif didn't publish. What was called geometric por portrait of pi, and that publication discussed how the Mathematical Gazette construction can be modified to present still better and better approximations to the square root of pi. It is clear by this time CJ was, uh, was interested at least as much in the mathematics as in the aesthetics of diagrams, and that his constructions produced very good approximations. However, by then, although he did understand that his constructions yielded an approximation, he still referred to the results as absolute squarings, which, you know, it, it's, it's two, two things, both ways. <laughs> okay, now, 
While CJ's construction used a straight edge and compass to produce an approximation of the square root of, of pi, most, most approximations of the most, most attempts at squaring, at, at solving the, un, the three unsolved problems, uses construction that uses a compass and a ruler with one mark. And that kind of a construction is referred to as a nusis construction. And nusis is the Greek word f meaning verging. Okay. Now we see what paintings uh, of nusis constructions, which one, the, f the one on the left is Archimedes' angle trisection. And then one on the right is based on a, a construction by Newton and that is one of five paintings he made of Nusus constructions about double cubes. That's what the problem of Delos is, is uh, doubling the cube. CJ wrote about this article and, and, and another one very much like it in his article in, in 1972 in Leonardo. Now, in 1970, oops, that's too early. In 1973, he switched his attention from the three well-known unsolved problems and started thinking about how to construct the regular polygons that were not to be constructible using only straight edge and compass. Now that was something that most amateur mathematicians knew nothing about. Uh, I'm not sure I knew about it either until I got to his work. Now he was aware that the 17th-sided regular polygon called a heptagon was the first one that couldn't be constructed that, using just ruler and con, and, and uh, uh, sorry, mark, uh, straight edge and compass. But he did understand that you could, if you, if you had a equilateral triangle where its apex angle was to, what? I saw, sorry, right, an isosceles right, a triangle with apex angle having two pi over seven radians you'd end up with 2 pi over 7 times 7 things if you put them all together and get 2 pi, which is um, 360 degrees. Now, I'm going to stop adding radians after a, when, I, when I give a, a, an angle measurement in, uh, in radians because you, once you have a pi there, it's always radians. It's not degrees. Okay. Now. In late August 1973, while C.J. and Ruth Krauss, his wife, were having lunch in Syracuse on the island of Sicily, C.J. had a major insight. Okay, what is it? Phil Nell describes it as follows. On the table in front of him were a menu, a wine list, and a container of toothpicks. Turning his menu and wine list so they formed the two equal sides of an isosceles triangle, he placed the toothpicks in a crisscross pattern across the space between these two sides. He then hypothesized that the angle where the menu and wine list intersected would be pi over 7 degrees. His supposition was correct, actually. It wasn't because it wasn't pi over 7 degrees, but that was what, what Phil Nell wrote. He was, he's an English professor. And he confused the two. <laughs> and I haven't told him that yet. <laughs> CJ, however, did do something. He gave the tr that triangle a name. He called it a heptagon one to two to three triangle. One to three to three. Thank you. I always do that, even though I read it. Hmm. Because why? The base angles are three pi over, three pi over seven. So therefore, the angles are in ratio 1 to 3 to 3. And so it's an easy way to, to uh, refer to them. Now, the proof that the apex angle of the, two pi, of the toothpick triangle measures pi over 2 is quite stra straightforward. But C. Shea had never seen the proof. So he, had, he did it himself, which he didn't have, have any problem with. But he thought he had come up with a new and important idea again, just like with the squaring of the triangle, uh, squaring of the circle. 
This time, though, he knew enough that he wanted to find a nuisance construction to show how this happens. He wasn't going to try, try an approximation. And he did succeed. He did find a nuisance construction that did it. But before it was published, he learned that in 1959, many years before, somebody else had already published something that showed the toothpick, essentially showed the toothpick construction for lots of, lots of angles, not just the, not just seven, but lots of them. Okay, now, CJ produced at least eight paintings related to his idea. These two, both from 1973, are very different. One just mimics the toothpick construction, while the other uses parts of a hep a toothpicks of the same color to show the equal size of three different heptagon one to, two, one to three to three triangles. In this one, it's clear, once again, art dominates over mathematics. In 1975, C.J. published his article about his, his uh, construction, again, in the Mathematical Gazette. And he made it very clear that his <coughs> nuisance cons constructions started by starting the, it was a nuisance construction by starting the proof, call the ends of a ruler A and Z, and towards A, place a mark on X. So he knew that much to do, to knew that. Now, the proof, together with two diagrams explaining it, took only about a, a third of the, of the article. Most of the remainder of the, of the article was devoted to the history of the problem and specifically what Archimedes is likely to have shown in what many believe is a lost book that he had wrote about constructing a regular hectagon. Now, I find most surprising, what I find most surprising about this article is that is referenced in several places on Wolfram's Math World, including the entry for the Nusis construction, where it is only one of two references given. Now, what I find most surprising about CJ was that he was able to write that article despite having no formal training in mathematics after high school. Now, among the paintings that show CJ's construction based on the seven toothpicks, most show only the construction of an angle that measures pi over seven. However, what are most likely his last three paintings all show a side of the heptagon that could be inscribed in the large circle in the painting. And these are not part of a heptagon 133 triangle. What they are are the chords down here on each of them um, that, and those are, that, that's the length of the side. So he really did have a good mathematical sense, and he had no training. But he cared, and so he got it himself. Now, unfortunately, he died four months after this article was published. And I will close with one more painting. It's the one that inspired uh, my husband, who's there and a mathematician, and, uh, and me to write the only joint article we've ever written. And it was about perspective. And he, that, and it is Alberti's perspective. And we looked at what Alberti was saying about perspective. Thank you. <laughs>